What type of kings were Jehoahaz and Jehoash in Israel and why? This is the question we seek to answer today as we continue our verse by verse study of the book of 2 Kings on walking through the Bible. Today we're going to be discussing 2 Kings chapter 13, verses 1 to 13. But before we do that, let's read the passage. If you have a Bible with you, turn to 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 1. But if you don't have a Bible, don't worry, just follow along with us on the screen. The version that we'll be reading from is the New King James Version. So 2 Kings chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. In the 23rd year of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, became king over Israel and Samaria, and reigned seventeen years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin. He did not depart from them. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of Hazael, king of Syria, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazael, all their days. So Jehoahaz pleaded with the Lord, and the Lord listened to him. For he saw the oppression of Israel, because the king of Syria oppressed them. Then the Lord gave Israel a deliverer, so that they escaped from the hand, under the hand of the Syrians. And the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before. And nevertheless, they did not part, depart from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, who had made Israel sin, but walked in them. And the wooden image also remained in Samaria. For he left of the army of Jehoahaz only fifty horsemen, ten chariots, and ten thousand foot soldiers. For the king of Syria had destroyed them and made them like the dust at the threshing. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoahaz, all that he did and his might, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Jehoahaz rested with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria. Then Joash his son reigned in his place. In the thirty-seventh year of Joash, king of Judah, Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, became king over Israel and Samaria and reigned sixteen years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin, but walked in them. Now the rest of the acts of Joash, all that he did in his might, which he, with which he fought against Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Joash rested with his fathers. Then Jeroboam sat on his throne, and Joash was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. After catching up the chronology to the end of the reign of Joash in, Joash in Judah, the writer of 2 Kings once again turns north and deals with the next two kings of Israel. The first one up is Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu. It is said that Jehoahaz began to reign in the 23rd year of Joash, king of Judah. However, we know that Joash began to reign in the seventh year of Jehu, who himself reigned for 28 years, meaning that Jehoahaz must have begun to reign in the 21st year of Joash of Judah. Now, this discrepancy could be dealt with in a couple of ways. One, there could be a two-year gap where there was no king in Israel after the death of Jehu. But unlike between Zimri and Amri, where such a gap is warranted due to the struggle for the throne that is recorded for us in Scripture, no such struggle is recorded here. Add to the fact that, Jehoha, that Jehoash, Jehoahaz's son, will take the throne in the 37th year of Joash after the 17-year reign of Jehoahaz, and this conclusion is shown to not be correct. Rather, the correct way th that this is dealt with is that Jehoahaz took the throne in Israel in the 21st year of Joash, king of Judah, with the text that we're translating from having a copyist error from the original, which said the 21st. This conclusion is actually supported in the text, for down in verse 10, the correct year of Jehoahash's ascension in relation to Joash and Judah is given. This means that the inspiration of God for 2 Kings is not being undermined one bit, for the original author of it got the dates correct. It does teach us, though, that copies of the original sometimes do contain copyist errors. These errors do not affect doctrine of Scripture and can be reconciled either by the text itself, which we have done here, or by comparing the vast amounts of manuscript copies that we have of the Old and New Testaments to piece together what the original said. We can thus have confidence that what we have is the unadulterated Word of God. Why then, if we could piece together what should have been written, don't our translators simply correct these copyist errors? Think about that for a moment. 
Would you want someone to change the text of Scripture simply because they know what it should have said? If translators do that here, where it actually doesn't matter, then what's to stop them from changing whole doctrines of Scripture, like on salvation or the church or worship? No, I would rather have the translators translate from the text that they have and have to deal with these difficulties head on, for there are answers that can be found, than to have to trust the translators that they made the correct corrections to what they believe the text should have said. Back to the text now. Jehoahaz reigned for 17 years in Samaria and did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. In what way was he evil? He followed in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin with the idols of Dan and Bethel. Sure, Jehoahaz didn't worship Baal, for his father rooted that out, but idolatry is still idolatry, and the Lord hated it. And for that, the Lord in his anger delivered Israel into the hands of Hazel and his son Ben-Hadad all their days. The phrase all their days does not likely mean all the days of Hazel and Ben-Hadad, for Hazel very likely outlived Jehoahaz, even if only for a short period before his son becomes king of Syria. Instead, what is meant here is exactly what verse 22 says, which is that Hazael oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoahaz, with his son likely included as a military leader. However, God did not allow Hazael to destroy Israel. Why? Because Jehoahaz pleaded with the Lord, and the Lord was gracious towards him. Now, this didn't mean that Jehoahaz fully repented, for he still kept the idolatry of Jeroboam, but Jehoahaz obviously humbled himself enough in order for the Lord to spare Israel from utter destruction, though the army of Israel was greatly reduced. That salvation, though, wouldn't come in Jehoahaz's day, but in the days of his son, Jehoash. And thus Jehoahaz died, which will bring our timeline around down to around 796 BC, and Jehoash, his son, reigned in his place. According to the passage, Jehoash came to power in the 37th year of Joash, king of Judah, which means that he was co-regent with his father for at least part of the final year of his father's reign. Now sometimes this man is referred to as Joash, and sometimes Jehoash, but for our purposes we're going to refer to him as Jehoash in order to distinguish him from the Joash reigning at the same time in Judah. Jehoash is said to have reigned for 16 years in Samaria, which will bring our timeline down at the end of his reign to about 781 BC. Like his father, Jehoash did evil in the sight of the Lord in not departing from the sins of Jeroboam, who made Israel to sin with their idolatry. Other than that, not much is said in this section about Jehoash other than the war he fought against Amaziah, king of Judah. But since we will see that war described to us in chapter 14, we'll save further comment on that until then. When Jehoash dies, his son Jeroboam, who we will refer to as Jeroboam II, will rule reign in his place. However, before we begin, before we discuss the reign of Jeroboam II, we must first deal with two intervening events, both of which occur during the days of Jehoash. The first one, which we'll deal with in the next lesson, is the death of Elisha, so we hope you'll return for that. With that, our time is up for today. The Lord willing, we hope you'll join us for tomorrow's discussion of 2 Kings chapter 13, verses 14 to 25, as we continue our walk through the Bible, one verse at a time. I'm not a Thank you for watching today's episode. We hope that you found it edifying and ask that you not only subscribe to our channel and podcast, but that you like and share this episode among your friends so that the saving gospel of Jesus Christ can go out to the whole world.